All right, here we are for part two of calculus and parametric equations. Now, part one, this was originally my slide for part one. I said, well, calculus involves derivatives and integrals in very rough terms. That's what it is. So here in part two, um, I wanted to do some problem types that involve integration or definite integrals with parametric equations, okay? And through doing that, I'll end up reviewing a little bit. Just like here when I did part one, I, I said, well, let's talk a little bit about how you know that this is the path of those parametric equations. And through doing some of this stuff, I reviewed a little bit of what we had already learned. Okay, so same thing with this one. I'll continue to review some things, hopefully getting it to the point where things sink in more and more for you. Um, so first thing I want to do in this video is to measure the arc length of a parametric curve. So let's say that, you know, parametric equations are going to have some path, all right? So this thing right there, that curve, then that's the path. If you eliminate t, you get some kind of an equation on the xy plane, some kind of a curve or a line or, or whatever it is. And we can look at a portion of that. So say I look at the path and I look at the portion of the path between some point found by t is a and some other point from t is b. And just suppose that we, we go along this path according to those continuously from this point to that point. All right, so not back and forth, but just from here to there, okay? So this here, the distance there, the length of that is called the arc length, all right? And you can find that by this formula. So what do you do? Uh, you take the derivative of the x equation and the y equation, and you square them, and you add them together, and you take the square root. It looks a little bit like the distance formula in two-dimensional space, all right? OK, so let's try that. Let's, let's do this one two ways, all right? So I'm going to, if, if it just says in generic terms, for the curve, calculate the arc length from t is 1 to t is 3 then that shouldn't be very hard, but I want to show you your options, okay? So here I'm gonna use calculus just so I can elaborate uh, about this a little bit, but there's another method for this one. I mean, this is a fairly basic problem to start with, but I could use calculus or geometry and arrive at the same answer, all right? So what does this say to do? Take the derivative of the x equation and the y equation, square them, add them together, and so on. So if I can make some notes up here, I'll say, well, that's x and dx dt is negative four, all right? And for this one, dy dt is five. Okay, so my distance from this point to that point should be the definite integral from 1 to 3 root 5 squared plus negative 4 squared dt. That should be a, that should be a pretty easy, easy integral to do. Okay, all right. Anyway, so this, what's this turn out to be? 1 to 3 root 25 and 16 so I get 41 dt and that's just a constant so my antiderivative is t root 41 given that that number is just a constant so I'll get 3 root 41 minus 1 root 41 so I'll get 2 root 41 and the units are distance Okay, so if there was some scale on our graph, then there would be units of distance that are established. Maybe they're feet or inches or something like that. All right. Okay, now, so for this one, that's not very hard. Uh, this can definitely get extremely difficult, way more difficult than it looks like. Uh, but all right, here's one that's fairly simple to begin with. Can you do this by geometry? Well, what's the path of these things? Isn't it linear? So can you tell that if we solve for t and we substitute that in for this, we'll get y equals mx plus b somehow, all right? Okay, so it is just a line. 
Now, maybe in a minute, we'll, we'll figure out exactly what that line is. But say that at least we can accept that the path is linear. Then what are we looking at? Where, where are you when t is 1? Let's just, let's get something like very basic going on. Okay, so here's my x and y plane. So where are we on that line when t is equal to 1? We're at uh, negative 3 and 8. Okay, so like maybe this point right here. So let's say negative 3 and 8. That's where we are when t is equal to 1. And then where are we when t is equal to 3? Okay, so let's put 3 in. 1 minus 12, uh, 1 minus, so, so 3, 1 minus 12 is negative 11, and, oh, I ran, I didn't leave myself room, hold on, pause, okay, so that's, that's, I redrew this, I scooped the y-axis over a little bit, but when t is 1, we're at negative 3 and 8, all right, and when t is 3, we're at negative 11 and then 18, okay, so negative 11, 18, will be like kind of up here. All right, so that's t is equal to 3. Uh, all right, and then there's some line that goes through this. That's my path. All right. So that line is the path of those parametric equations. At this time, or at that value of t, you're here, and at this value of t, you're here. Now, if the question says, find for the curve, calculate the arc length from this point to that point, that's just the distance along the path. Well, that would be this a line. That would be the shortest distance between two points is a line. That's what the distance formula calculates for us. All right? So, all right, we're after this thing right here. Okay. Like, how far is that? This little portion of that line. Or do we understand what that means? And I can use the distance formula. So, D is equal to, remember that distance formula? You subtract the x's. So, a negative 11 minus negative 3, so that's, uh, what is it? So negative 11 minus 3, so that's going to be 9 squared. Okay. And then 18 minus 8, so that's going to be 10 squared. Okay, so I get root, so 81, so 181. Okay, and then that will reduce a little bit further. 181... Oops, okay. Not 9. 8 squared. 8, 9, 10, 11. So that a difference in the x is going to be 8. Difference in the y is going to be 10. So I get 164. Okay, 164. So that reduces. That's uh, 164 is 4 times 41. So that's going to be 2 root 41. Okay, and that's confirmation. All right, so yeah, I wanted to confirm that answer. I, so I can use basic geometric formulas, basic geometric concepts, uh, the distance between two points along a straight line. That's what this is versus the calculus formula. I can get agreement, okay? All right, now we could do that if we knew this path was a line, all right, which, which it's not hard to figure out for these that it is a line. Uh, if that path was curved, then this probably is going to work out to be significantly more complicated. All right. Uh, so let's go and look at one. It might be a little more complicated. So here, I chose this one because, one, I wanted to do one a little harder than the last one. And two, I wanted to review something I brought up uh, in a previous video that was on another assignment. It was the cycloid. Okay. So the question says, calculate the length of one arc of a cycloid generated by a circle. I should have put, you know, circle slash wheel. Because when we talked about a cycloid, I imagined having a wheel rolling along the x-axis. Okay? So I would like to do that, and I give a little hint about a trig identity that we might need. So, all right, I wanted to do this partially to review this idea. Here's the actual slide that I would have used in, a, in an earlier video when we talked about the cycloid, okay? And I said, this looks like this. Imagine a wheel that rolls uh, to the right along the x-axis. Observed a fixed point on the wheel move through space as the wheel rolls, all right? If you could watch this point, choose any point on this, and just keep your eye on it. Maybe, like, imagine that uh, it was pitch black, totally dark, 
and you had a wheel rolling on a perfectly straight line on flat ground, and then there was a light on it. The light wouldn't be spinning like the wheel. The light would be moving through these arcs that kind of go up, bounce off the ground, go up, bounce off, the, and so on. These arcs uh, are cycloidal arcs, okay? All right, so in red, that's the cycloid. If you take the wheel out of the picture and just look at the arcs, that's the cycloid, all right? Okay, so that's what a cycloid is. I talked a little bit more about that in a previous video, though. Um, now, this curve, all right, we can track every single point on it, not as a function of time, but as a function of that angle, the angle that the wheel rotates, okay? So, in other words, the location of any point, any point on those arcs, okay? is going to be x is r theta minus sine theta, where theta is the angular rotation of the wheel. The point starts at the bottom, the wheel rolls, this angle opens up, all right? So, okay, x is r theta minus sine theta, y is r one minus cosine theta. r is the radius of the wheel. So those are our equations, okay? All right, so let's, let's say equations, got to have equations. All right, what are the equations of a cycloid, a cycloidal arc generated by a wheel of radius 2? What the thing I just showed you, uh, x is 2 times theta minus sine theta, and y is 2 times 1 minus cosine theta. Those will get you the arcs, all right? Okay. Uh, now, back to where we started. So I need to take the derivative of x and y with respect to t, square them, add them together, and so on, and then decide on my bounds, all right? So what gets you one arc of this? Let's talk about that. So the point starts at the bottom of the wheel, right here, and then it rolls, and the angle opens up. What does this angle have to be to get that point? That would be one arc. Theta is zero right here. And how much has the wheel turned to put that point that started at the bottom back at the bottom? Well, that'd be two pi, all right? 360 degrees. Now I put zero degrees, I should have zero radians, two pi radians. Zero degrees, 360 degrees. We need, we'll use radians in our interval though. Okay, so here it goes, here it goes. Uh, I'll get one arc of the cycloid. Since I wanna calculate the length of one arc, uh, my limits will be zero is theta to two pi. That'll get you one arc. That will turn that wheel 360 degrees around. Okay, so here's what we need. We need uh, x prime, I guess the derivative of this, so that's going to be 2, 1 minus cosine theta, okay? And y prime, that's going to be 2 times sine theta, right? What's the derivative of 1 minus cosine theta? It's sine theta. Furthermore, I need x prime squared. That'd be 4, 1 minus cosine theta squared. And I need y prime squared. That'd be 4 sine squared theta. All right, let's put these in our formula. Uh, the length of one arc of a cycloid will be the integral from 0 to 2 pi times the square root. I got a lot to write down this time. 4 one minus cosine theta squared plus four sine squared theta, all right, d theta, theta is the variable, all right. Okay, so first of all, so several things, let's do this. Let's, let's just work on the inside. And I don't wanna keep copying the integral sign and the root and all that just to work out the inside, because that's the part I need to simplify. So if I did that, I'll get four, right? 
and I'll square this out. This will be 1 minus 2 cosine theta plus cosine square theta. Okay? And then that will be 4 sine squared theta. I won't change it. So that first, that's what I'm going to get if I square out the 1 minus cosine. Okay? Now I see 4 is common to both terms. So I'm going to factor it out. And if I factor out the 4, I'll get 1 minus 2 cosine theta plus cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. All right. It's common to both terms. In addition to that, what can you say about this? Because I need to simplify this as much as I can. Well, that is 1. So what additionally can you say about that? This is 4, 1, and 1. That's 2. 2 minus 2 cosine theta. All right. Okay, now that's more like it. That's more like it. That's what's under the root. Now, imagine this under that root. What's the square root of 4? That's 2. So I'm going to get this. 0, 2 pi, 2 root 2 minus 2 cosine theta. D theta. Okay. That's the square root of 4 right there. Root 4, root 2 minus 2 cosine theta. Okay, now, so let's take a look at this. I think we've done all the easy stuff, if you want to call that easy. I think we've done all the easy stuff to reduce this. Let's see. Um, is there anything else? Well, there was this hint. Does that seem to fit down there? Let's see. 1 minus cosine t over 2 is sine squared t over 2. So let's let's do like this. I, this is, you know, kind of a generic form that the identity is given. But let's try this. Say I take this, which was given in, as a hint, and I think that I need to use it at this point. If I took this and multiplied it by 4, I would get that. Okay. So right here, that was a hint. It's given that I probably need to use that to simplify this integral at some point. So I multiply it by 4, and I'll get what I need. So let's see, 4 on the left side, 2, okay, 2 minus 2 cosine t, that's what we have, all right, equals, on the other side, 4 sine squared t over 2. Now that's an identity that we can apply to this, okay? That's given in the form that we need it to be. So I could say with the variable theta, 2 minus 2 cosine theta is 4 sine squared theta over 2, all right. So I, now I think I got something. 0, 2 pi, 2 root 4 sine squared theta over 2 d theta. Okay. Now, 4 is a perfect square, and so is sine squared. I didn't have a way to reduce this root across that subtraction. But multiplication is a different story. So let's look at it like this. This is root 4 times root sine squared theta over 2. It's not true that root of number a plus root of number b is equal to root of a plus root of b. Plus or minus. In other words, I can't reduce that. But it is true, as long as nothing's negative, that root a times root b is root a times root b. All right, so roots can split apart across division or multiplication. Okay, so that's a 4 root, so it's 2. So I'll get 0, 2 pi, 4, which is 2 times square root of 4, that's 2 times 2, times sine theta over 2. Okay, now to work from here, we would use u-substitution on this part. 
Um, and if we're in calculus two, we probably know how to do u substitution pretty well. But if you do u substitution and let u be theta over two, then you'll get a, a fairly easy form of integration. But what you'll get is eight cosine theta over two. That's the antiderivative that you'll get. Oh, sorry, minus eight, because the derivative of cosine is minus sine. Okay, now from here, I evaluate between my bounds. If I put two pi in, I'm gonna get negative eight cosine two pi over two, so that's pi minus negative eight cosine. If I put zero in, I'm just gonna get zero. So what's this? Well, uh, cosine pi is negative one, so that's eight, and cosine zero is one, so that's eight. So, all right, so I'll get 16. All right, 16, 16 what? Well, it's distance. Okay, so if you can imagine, uh, imagine that the, this wheel had a radius of two feet and it rolled and you watch that point travel through space along this arc, then that distance would be 16 feet. That's what we're saying. I'm gonna give the number 16. It's a distance in other words. All right, well, so there's two arc length problems. One was easy and then the other one's on the other end of the spectrum, much harder. Uh, but it's calculus, it's, we know how we can do derivatives. Uh, we can use identities and algebra and so on. There might be lots of little things along the way you need to ask about, but uh, if anything not clear in the video, then you can ask me. So let's do one more thing. Last topic, let me see. Yeah, so this last topic, uh, finding the surface area of a solid of revolution. Now, it's kind of hard to explain the setup for that without doing a problem. So I thought I would just in very basic terms tell you the setup that's involved, but I'll really have to explain it by doing an example, okay? There's only so much I can tell you without actually working through an example. But uh, suppose you have some kind of curve given by parametric equations, and you rotate it around the x-axis. Then what was a curve becomes a three-dimensional shape, okay? All right, so like if you had a semicircle Okay, so imagine you had this, and you rotated it around that way, then that would produce a sphere. That's what I'm saying, okay? Take something flat and spin it around, get something three-dimensional, all right? This formula will tell you the surface area of that shape, whatever it is, okay? So notice the order here. This right here, that's our y function in terms of t. We take the derivative of each, we square them, we add them together, we take the root, and we have a factor of two pi in there, okay? All right, so let's look at an example. So this one, so I got parametric equations like so, and I'm only looking at the part of those for zero to one for t. Take that, revolve it around the x-axis, and then tell me the surface area of what you get, all right? So, well, let's see what we're dealing with, all right? Just so I can explain it a little bit. So let's see, where are, where, this is a line, okay? So first of all, lines are the simplest of all things that we deal with, but the path there is linear, okay? If you substitute this for t there, you get y is two minus x, that's a straight line. Uh, and my first point when t is zero is zero and two, so we're up there. And my next point when t is one is one and one, okay? Oh, sorry, I wanted to do it. I had a wrong number. I, I wanted it to be from zero to two. Okay, so we'll get two and zero, so down here. Okay, so that's my points from zero to two. All right, now, for this one, it's a line. Imagine if you took this space 
and you revolved it 360 degrees around the x-axis. What would this become if you did that? It would become a cone. Okay? It would become a cone. This triangle, spin around. Imagine if this was like a flat, like we had an axis here, and we had like a, a rigid cardboard triangle, and then we spun it around so fast it was just a blur then that would have the appearance of being a cone. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what we mean by a solid of revolution, all right? So it's, it's, for this one, it's like we're asking for the surface area of this cone. It would be a cone that had a height of two and a, a, a radius there of two, okay? All right, so that's what we're dealing with. Now, I just wanted to say a little bit about that before we poured into the math, but you know, this is what I'm up against now at this point, all right? So let's see, what's x prime and y prime in this case? What are those derivatives? 1 and negative 1. And then y goes there, okay, and I got 2 pi otherwise. So here's my surface area. Okay, so I got this cone, kind of looks like this. This circular opening has a radius of 2, and that height has a radius of 2 also. Okay, so it's going to be... The integral from 0 to 2. What were the bounds of t to create the original object? 0 to 2. Uh, 2 pi, and then that's the y. All right? 2 minus t. Okay. Then times the root of the derivatives of each the y and the x. So that's 1 and negative 1. So it's like 1 squared plus negative 1 squared, or dt. So there's our formula, all right? So let's see what we get. 2 pi, that factor is just going to hang around for now. 2 minus t, same thing there, and this is root 2, okay? So I'll get, let's group the constants together. I'm going to get 0 to uh, 2 pi root 2. Let's say it like that. Okay. And then 2 minus t. All right. Antiderivative. That's just a constant. And then this has antiderivative 2t minus t squared over 2. Okay. Evaluate. Uh, 2 first. So I'll get 2 pi root 2. And for 2, I'll get 4 minus 2. So I'll get 2. And then 2 pi root 2, I'll put 0 in and I'll get 0. So my answer, uh, 4 pi root 2. Uh, 4 pi root 2, what? Well, it depends on the original units. You know, uh, say we're given this and this was two feet and that was two feet. And we get this cone as a result. Two foot, two foot radius there, two foot length. Then this is in square feet. All right. It has it has units of area. All right. So all right, maybe this not so bad then. But it's after the others we did, maybe it's not so bad. All right. OK, but I gave you the formula and I had a little bit of a detailed setup, maybe more detailed than you'll actually need, just so you can see what's going on when you do this, all right? But you can associate surface area with this formula otherwise if you want to. Now, we'll pay attention to something that when we read this question, seems a lot like the last one, but it's just enough different that we might miss it, okay? So again, I get parametric equations which give me some kind of shape. I'm not concerned about the shape at all. I already showed you that yes, you can take something flat and you can rotate it around and you can get something three-dimensional and then you can measure the surface area of that. All right. The area on the outside. So let's say that sure you can do that with this one. We don't have to concern ourselves at the moment with what it looks like. Okay. But it says all the same stuff but revolve it around the y-axis. Okay. That would just change one thing about this. Notice here I said, if you have those parametric equations and you want to revolve around the x-axis, well, that's the x prime and the y prime, and then that's the y, all right? 
So the only thing that would change if we were going to revolve around the y-axis instead of the x is this would be the x instead of the y. Okay? All right. So here goes then. Let me get all the stuff I need. Okay, so x prime, that's going to be 3 fourths t squared. And this other deal, y prime, that's going to be 6. All right, so our surface area formula is going to be definite integral, 1 to 2, 2 pi, and what should this be? Should this be the y or the x? Well, if we rotate around the y-axis, it should be the x, okay? So, all right, I'm going to take 1 4th t to the third power. Okay. Then times the square root of x prime squared and y prime squared. So, in my case, I'll get 3 4th t squared squared plus 6 squared. Okay, so that's the whole setup. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and just... I, you know, in the other problem, I reduced this by itself. I think I just should write, go ahead and write the next step. Okay? So 1 to 2. Let's cancel the 2 and the 1 fourth. So that's going to be a half pi t to the third power. Okay? Then here, for this, I'll get 9 sixteenths t to the fourth power if I apply that exponent plus 36. Okay. Now, here it's like we might think, well, we're stuck. What do we do now? But it's like with every integral, we just have to figure out some way to reduce it, some way to simplify it, <coughs> some way to turn it into something that we know how to do and something that we recognize. So with this one, I'm thinking u substitution. The derivative of that inside part is going to be 9 fourths t to the third power which we can get out there, all right? So let's just do that. I've got this constant t to the third power dt. So let's do it by u substitution. Uh, I'm not comfortable doing that one in my head, so I'm going to write it out over here, okay? So let's see. We got uh, 1 half pi t to the third power root 9 sixteenths t to the fourth power plus 36. All right, so we'll let, for this, u substitution, we'll let u be 9 sixteenths t to the fourth power plus 36. du, bringing that four down, 9 fourths t to the third power dt. And I've got the t to the third power dt. I have that okay. So let's isolate this t to the third power dt multiply by 4 ninths. So we'll get 4 ninths du is t to the third power dt. Okay, so this one fits okay up there, and this one fits okay up there. So in this next step, both of these, I'll get this. 1 half pi u to the one half power, and then t to the third power dt is four ninths du. Okay, so that's everything that we get. All right, in one step of substitution. Now I should really just deal with all these constants. I got a one half of four ninths. That's going to be two ninths. So let's go ahead, let's take 2 ninths pi, and we'll remove that. And then we'll leave u to the 1 half power du. So we'll get this. Now that I've reduced it there, we have a formula to take it the rest of the way. So I got 2 ninths pi u to the 3 over 2 power over 3 over 2 plus c. So then I'm going to get 4 over 27, right? 4, 2 times 2, 3 times 9, 27. 
pi, and then u, 9 sixteenths, t to the fourth plus 36. Okay, so there's my antiderivative by u substitution. All right, now, so let's use that over here then. All right, I found it here. I got my antiderivative on the other page. I'll continue this way. So, antiderivative of that, 4 over 27 pi, 9 sixteenth t to the fourth power, plus 36, 3 over 2, evaluated between 1 and 2. All right, so for 2, 2 to the fourth power 16, I'll get 9 plus 36, okay, so I'll get 45. So let's say 4 over 27 pi, 45, 3 over 2 power. And then minus 4 over 27 pi. If I put 1 in, I get 9 sixteenths plus 36. So let's see, 36, 16, let's see. Plus, all right, so I get 585 over 16. 3 over 2 power. All right. Now from here, like that, not a nice round number for sure. This is the square root of 45 to the third power times pi times 4 over. So you get the idea. So if, if we just calculate this, which is all we can really do at this point, then we'll get 37, 37.6. Okay, with some rounding, if I round in the nearest tenth. Now, once again, though, right, so I did the math. 37.6, what? What's the, the number's got to mean something. Well, we took something flat, rotated around, calculated surface area. Surface area has units of area, okay? All right, so don't forget your numbers. Don't forget your units. If the units happen to be give, given from the beginning, everything's in feet, then we would definitely say square feet on that. 